Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, a Friday afternoon, busy week. We were just talking like it's a fly-out day. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for being here. Um, it's a really wonderful turnout. We have got a great uh, set of speakers today. I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Um, only for the last few weeks, though, so I can't take too much credit. Um, let me start by thanking our host today, the Clean Energy and Technology Staff Association. And my new friend, Danielle Moon, is here with us. And she's going to come, come up and say a few words to welcome everybody here today. So come on up, Danielle. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Danielle Moon. Um, I work for Congressman Joaquin Castro from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I'm the president and founder of the Clean Energy and Technology Staff Association. Um, as I think we were supposed to have a slide oh, on our... Let me uh, see if I can do that. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so as shown on the slide, um, we are founded in the 115th Congress and is a bipartisan and bicameral staff association with over 90 members. Um, and um, our mission is to promote educational opportunities and host lively conversations about um, clean energy technologies. So if you're not a member, I highly encourage you to join us as we have many more exciting events coming up. Um, next month, we're going to have a, a briefing on nuclear energy with MIT um, and a toy drive with the Nuclear Energy Institute. So if you'd like to join or learn more about us, you can come find me or use that email address. Uh, we have our officers here today over there on the corner, um, Lawrence and Sangina. So you can come talk to any of the three of us um, if you're interested. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it to Dan Thanks. to start the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, this is actually uh, ESI's first time working on a briefing with um, this staff association. So hopefully we'll get off to a great start, and this will be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, today we're going to talk about the growing role of renewable energy in the U.S. energy mix. We have a wonderful panel today um, that will help us understand uh, the importance and the potential for renewable energy and storage to power our daily lives and, most importantly, to do so in a less carbon-intensive way. For those new to EESI, we were founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to help educate and inform policymakers, stakeholders, and the general public about the benefits of a low-emissions economy. In 1988, EESI declared that addressing climate change is a moral imperative, a sentiment that has since guided our work. Today, we are fully engaged on the climate change policy debate and committed to working with Congress to find workable solutions now and looking ahead. One way we are active on Capitol Hill is by working with our clean energy allies to organize and present briefings. We'll cover a lot of topics today, but if you want to learn more about any specific renewable energy technologies and policies that encourage investments in this space, well, good luck for you because you can visit EESI.org for uh, summaries of all of our briefings, videos of most of our briefings, fact sheets like you wouldn't believe, uh, lots and lots and lots of information to help you do dig, uh, deep dives on any of the issues. And just specifically in the last year, uh, we've had briefings on renewable biogas, beneficial electrification, hydroelectric power, uh, as well as issues like um, the perception of climate change in the mind of the public, uh, the special needs of families in rural areas. Just a few days ago, the Energy Information Administration released its short-term energy outlook. And the findings in this report confirm that not only is renewable energy a critical piece of the U.S. energy mix today, but it will continue to be so in more in the coming years. I hope we all know that hydropower is the top generator of renewable energy in the United States. According to EIA, it will count for about 7% of total U.S. energy generation. That's important because hydropower is a leading source of energy storage and helps promote energy system resilience. The overall trend in renewable energy growth is pointing upward. EIA sees non-hydropower renewable energy generation to increase 12% of, to, to, to 12 percent, sorry, of total utility scale generation. And renewable energy growth is a major contributor to EIA's estimates about U.S. carbon dioxide emissions reductions, lower by 1.7% in 2019 and by about 2% in 2020. And now we'll move on to our panelists. We will leave plenty of time for questions after their presentation, so please Hold them until then, and we'll do our best to get everybody uh, a chance to ask their question. Our first speaker is Bill Parsons. He's the Chief Operating Officer of the American Council on Renewable Energy. ACOR is a national nonprofit organization that unites finance, policy, and technology to accelerate the transition to a renewable energy economy. Prior to ACOR, Bill served as Chief of Staff and Legislative Director to then-Representative Chris Van Hollen. 
and managed the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus for eight years. Bill was also a founding board member of the Montgomery County Green Bank. Bill, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, thank you so much for the nice introduction um, and to the whole uh, EESI team. Uh, I, uh, it's nice to be back in 20, 2167. We never served on TNI, but we uh, had the extended stints on uh, Ways and Means, OGR, and uh, Education and Labor. Um, so uh, my job in the next 10 minutes or so is to kind of set the table um, on the sector writ large, and then I'm really delighted to be here with my colleagues, and, and I'm going to step down and let them speak uh, to their areas of expertise uh, on the, uh, the, the technologies um, that they cover. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Not a problem at all. Uh, I'm also aware that there was competition for your attention today, so thanks for... Uh, uh, thanks for the interest and for showing up. It's, it's important. So as uh, I mentioned, um, uh, ACOR is, is the largest pan-renewable organization in town. Uh, and what that means is we're multi-technology, and we also were across the transaction. So we have uh, uh, manufacturers, developers, utilities, big corporate off-takers like Facebook, Amazon, and Google, uh, and uh, also investors, uh, uh, the big banks who invest, infrastructure funds, private equity, uh, and the like. So that's the lens that we bring uh, to the renewable energy sector. First slide I'm going to show you here um, is uh, uh, total renew renewable energy installations. What I want to call out for you, I apologize that it appears that the, um, the legend is, is kind of halved out there, but you can see what, 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 it's, what it's getting at. Um, since we had the last full year of data we have was for 2018, 19.5 uh, um, gigawatts of capacity added uh, in 2018. Um, and uh, that's the second highest um, year ever, so, so still decent um, uh, momentum. Uh, and it happened in a, in a, in a backdrop of uh, many people in this, in this room will, will appreciate pretty uh, static electricity demand. There's not a lot of growth in electricity demand and hasn't been for about the last uh, decade. So in, you know, in the face of uh, flat electricity demand, uh, relatively low natural gas prices, uh, and many in this room will also appreciate the phasing down and out uh, under current law anyway of the existing legacy credits for, uh, for wind, solar, and other um, uh, technologies, some of which actually lost their credits in the end of 2017 when the uh, underlying extenders bill uh, was not renewed, uh, which is unfinished business that we can cover before the end of the uh, event today. Over this period, renewable energy uh, accounted for about 50 percent of new power generation. So you can, you can see the, um, the kind of order of magnitude of growth um, that we're talking about in the sector. Uh, I mentioned our membership includes uh, investors, so we track renewable energy uh, investment. Um, Again, not a record year in 2018. Uh, that was set back in 2011. Uh, but $48.5 uh, billion is nothing uh, to sneeze at. We have uh, another uh, metric that we use connected with uh, ACOR's 1T by uh, 2030 uh, campaign, which is a drive to uh, secure $1 trillion uh, in private sector investment in renewable energy and enabling grid technologies between 2018 and 2030. When you take that 48.5 and you add in what we would characterize as enabling grid technology, my colleague Jason Berwin, classic case of this is energy storage, you get something closer to 56.7 billion invested uh, in, 20, uh, in 2018. Global investment. Uh, cumulatively, that's 3.2 trillion since 2004. In 2018, the U.S. portion of this uh, figure was $289 billion. There are 176 countries with renewable energy targets, and almost all of them uh, signed up for Paris, uh, representing about 98% of, 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 uh, of global emissions. So what accounts for um, renewable energy growth that we've seen uh, in the last decade, uh, which has been impressive, although, as has been noted, um, is still, when you add to hydro and, uh, and wind and solar and, and the rest of the renewable technologies, um, you know, we're, hello, Carol Warner. Uh, we are, um, we're hovering just under 20% uh, 
Uh, and uh, for the goals that probably many in this room have uh, in terms of uh, addressing the climate crisis, uh, grid decarbonization is going to require far higher levels of, uh, of renewable penetration. We'll get to that in, in a couple slides. When we look at how we account for the growth so far, we found uh, four um, principal explanations to describe for you. Um, uh, the first is um, state RPSs and CESs and goals and so forth. Um, you don't have to look at this in too much detail, but the, you know, I think for as long as I've been in this sector, the kind of received conventional wisdom has been, and especially now, you know, the federal government and federal policy is not a particularly fertile uh, you know, ground for progress on clean energy or climate. I think we have an opportunity to change that this year, which we're going to try to get into before the end of this session. But meanwhile, the states have taken the lead, and, and they have been a really important factor, uh, these renewable goals across these states, uh, for driving uh, renewable uh, deployment and investment. Uh, these are some of the uh, states that have uh, an illustrative list that have, um, and, these, and, I should, and I should say, and this, is, this list sort of exhibits uh, the trend, getting far more uh, ambitious. You're seeing, you know, 100% uh, goals. Um, I, was, I was on a panel a couple weeks ago in Maryland. Um, Governor Hogan uh, uh, let the 50% uh, goal get signed by 2030, get signed into law, and promptly announced that he felt it was not uh, ambitious enough and charged his Secretary of the Environment to come up with a 100% goal uh, for clean energy. He wants to expand the uh, qualifying resources uh, by 2050. So there is, probably folks have noticed, you know, there's, uh, there's something in the air. Um, that people are, are getting serious about this, more uh, uh, states. Also cities, uh, over 100 cities and 10 counties have raised their hand for 100% clean energy goals. Um, this kind of, these kind of goals and mandates uh, absolutely do drive demand, and, and they can inform uh, one of the policy recommendations I'll offer when we get into the, into the Q&A, because I think we can take this, um, this policy tool national. Uh, second driver of renewable energy growth uh, and this is really significant. I mentioned part of our membership are, are large corporate off-takers with, with renewable energy goals, the corporates. Um, look at this year-over-year -year growth. You've got, in 2017, you've got uh, 2.8 gigawatts, uh, 17 rather, and then 2018, over triple to 8.6. Massive growth uh, being driven by uh, corporate, uh, private sector corporate renewable energy goals. Really significant trend in the sector, and we don't see that stopping, we see, we, we see, the, we see that growing. Uh, on the other side, uh, you want to look at that on kind of the corporate side, this is a slide um, that represents uh, distributed solar demand, not just the blue graph is residential, the, uh, the yellow portion of the bar um, is non-residential, uh, you know, kind of uh, CNI commercial industrial scale like PV on a Walmart. Um, and you'll see it's roughly dist uh, evenly distributed there in, in 2018, um, approaching uh, five, a little bit under five gigawatts, I think. Uh, not quite a record year in 2018, but near the top. Uh, and so that, um, the, the demand for, for distributed solar uh, is also uh, a significant driver right now. Um, third reason, dramatic improvements, dramatic reductions in cost. So you see here over the last decade, 88% reduction in the levelized cost for solar, 69% reduction uh, for wind. Um, this, uh, we're going to sort of show some of the same data on a, on a chart that compares different um, generation resources. This is an unsubsidized chart. So the, the, the numbers on the bottom show a bottom end of the range, numbers on the top, top end of the range. And the thing I want to call out for you is unsubsidized. This is without reference to any credits, any other incentives, um, onshore wind and solar PV are directly competitive with natural gas today in many regions of the country. Why are there differences? Um, you get differences in the size of the installations, the technology used, the ge ge geography where they're uh, placed, and also financing costs. So that's why you see a range here. But I would just point out that these legacy credits, the PTC for wind and other technologies, the ITC for solar, have been an indisputable uh, policy success, uh, attracting capital investment, driving deployment, increasing volume, 
decreasing per unit cost to the point where we're now competitive in many parts of the country, even without the credits. Massive federal success. Thank you, Congress. Finally, we just going to talk about the, um, the tax uh, situation here. Um, uh, 2015, there was an agreement, both the Wind PTC and the Solar ITC, uh, to phase down uh, and eventually, um, in the case of the, the Wind PC, to, to, to phase out. Um, we're at 2019 on this chart, so the, the sort of navy blue color is wind. You see it back in 2016, it was at 100%. This is a production tax credit, so it's 2.4 cents. Uh, and then it, there was a, a, a glide path down here, uh, so that this year is the last year where if, if you have, if you're qualifying, which means you commence construction, uh, basically means if you can, if you can document that 5% of your total spend is incurred this year, you reserve the ability to, re to receive uh, the 40% of the original PTC over the next uh, 10 years, provided you're placed, you're, you're actually in operation um, four years later. Um, that, absent a change in current law, that PTC is phasing down and out this year. Uh, this, the gold bar here uh, is solar. So the thing to notice here, again, going back to, to 2019, is the uh, solar still gets qualifies for 100% um, uh, of the ITC, and the phase down begins starting next year. Um, and it will phase down uh, until it gets to a third uh, of the original uh, credit value um, uh, starting in 2022. And that, I, I, sh I should point out, is only available for, um, for utility uh, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, commercial scale. Uh, it, it, it phases out um, uh, for resi. Um, just got my one minute thing, so the timing is perfect. Here's, here, here's sort of maybe my, I want to offer some inspiration here and, and to thank you again for, for choosing to be here relative to the other things you could have spent your time on. I was really struck by this, this quote uh, amidst the other things we can concern ourselves with. It says, the same way we look back today and have pride in the things our grandparents did to defend democracy, our grandchildren are going to look back and have feelings about what we did today with respect to the climate crisis. What those feelings are will depend on what we decide to do. So I look forward to engaging with all of you about what we can decide to do. And thanks again for the invitation. Thank you, Bill. Um, one thing that I wanted to call attention to, in some of your slides, there were big spikes circa 2011, 2010-ish. And then there were some pretty big reductions in that same 2010, 2011 time frame. My guess is that that's attributable to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Yes. Okay, yes. good. Um, that was huge, uh, and it's no coincidence that um, the, the, the off, you know, that started in 2009, it ramped down in 2012, um, but that's a huge driver for a lot of these. And I think it's really interesting that the, 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 um, the levels uh, of cost reduction and the levels of investment have come back, right? The stimulus did what it was supposed to do for these technologies. Uh, I think that's exactly right, and maybe the, the follow-on piece of good news, which is not an argument for inertia or inattention, but uh, notwithstanding I, what I would describe as, as not coherent federal policy as it relates to renewable energy deployment and investment, we do have momentum from the years of smart policy that, that, is, that so far is carrying us through. We are at an inflection point as it relates to the phase down of the legacy credits. And we can talk about what that might mean and what we might do about it. But I think that's a great point about why the 2011 spike hits. The, and it's also useful to point out there's, there was a two hour delay, a, a two year delay between a, appropriation of funds or the provision of, 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 of grants and when they start showing up in the deployment numbers. Um, but we're, we're, we're benefiting from, from past uh, years of, of smart policy, and it's, it's going to fall to all of us to, uh, to engineer some smart policy for the next decade Great. plus. Thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Will Pettit. He is the Executive Director of the Geothermal Resources Council. GRC is a nonprofit professional association founded in 1972, and today it boasts 1,200 members in 44 countries. Will is an applied geophysicist expert in subsurface science and geomechanics. I love introducing scientists. It's so cool. Um, I'm not one. I don't know anything about any of that. Um, before leading GRC, he managed consulting companies in Minneapolis and across the pond in the United Kingdom. Will, it's great to have you.
to. Okay, let's see if the technology works for me. Yes. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. And it's a real pleasure to speak with you all. Um, there's no doubt that geothermal energy will be a huge success in the near future. And we're on the brink of a boom in the industry. This is because the energy transition needs us as society decarbonizes and electrifies over the next few decades. We've had an industrial revolution, we've had a technology revolution, and now we're inside an energy revolution. For that revolution, society will need a mix of renewable and clean energies, as well as a huge leap in energy efficiency and heat management, and all of the above clean energy strategy. We will need renewable and clean energies that are always on, no matter what the time and whatever the weather. This means thinking outside the box in terms of how we manage our energy supply and consumption. And we're going to need to collaborate as a renewable energy industry to get to 100%. In this presentation, I'm going to provide an introduction into where geothermal is heading and how it fits into the US energy mix. So geothermal energy is the recovery of heat from the earth that is then converted to electricity or used directly. The earth is a huge heat source that constantly transports heat from its center to the surface by thermal convection and conduction. Geothermal technologies and industries then capture that heat for a wide range of uses. It's a renewable energy source that emits very low greenhouse gases, just like solar or wind, except the energy comes from within the planet beneath our feet. That energy can be a few meters depth to thousands of meters depth. One of its benefits, as well as one of its challenges, is that it's hidden almost completely from view beneath us. Surface installations that use geothermal energy have the smallest footprint of all the renewable energies, so it simply doesn't have the bright visibility of other energy sources such as solar or wind. But it's always there. As a renewable baseload resource, geothermal supplies energy continuously. Geothermal industries can be split, broadly split into four types. Extraction of natural hydrothermal hot waters at temperatures usually well above 100 degrees C and from great depths to generate electricity. Direct use of cooler water for industrial and community heating systems usually between 40 and 100 degrees C, and then geothermal heat pumps that work at lower temperatures with shallow installations to heat or cool individual buildings or houses. They are the geothermal equivalent to rooftop solar. The fourth type is known as EGS, enhanced geothermal systems, where deep reservoirs are engineered to circulate water in a rock heat exchanger. These systems do not need hot water in place, but instead rely on enhancing natural permeability through pumping fluids continuously. These guys are in a research phase, but offer huge potential. So let's ask ourselves this. Where is my clean energy coming from on a still dark winter night in 2030? And what about 2050? Well, let's stop and think about what that moment in 2030. There are three things that are certain to be happening in our society. Firstly, decarbonization. Renewable portfolio standards and greenhouse gas emission targets will increase penetration of renewable power in the electricity market and be replacing carbon emitting generation with a carbon free energy mix. Secondly, electrification. Our ground transportation will electrify as demand for electric vehicles increases substantially and technical innovations see electric trucks enter in the market. There will also be pressures to electrify our homes, buildings and industries by making them more energy efficient and removing carbon emitting heating and industrial systems. Thirdly, and possibly most controversially, climate change. It's here and it's a scientific fact. The global climate will continue getting hotter and extreme weather events more common. This is going to drive public opinion and accelerate decarbonization and electrification over the following decades. All this means that electricity demands will increase, 
Peak loads will move to later in the evening and during the winter. Storage and energy efficiencies can play big roles, but clearly can't meet all the future demands when solar and wind cannot. Society will also need clean and renewable energies that work through the night in any weather and are efficient during the winter months. These things are already happening. In California, and as, a, as an example, RPS and GHG emission targets mean that government agencies are needing to find practical solutions across a broad range of activities. California will be 60% renewable by 2030 and have reduced emissions to 40% below 1990 levels. States across this great nation will follow the same path with 29 now having adopted RPS targets. Policies for fighting climate change and lowering greenhouse gas emissions will yield procurement of geothermal energy in both heat and power on an unprecedented scale. So what does geothermal bring? While it can make a significant impact to building jobs and providing economic benefits in local communities across the nation, geothermal power production creates quality jobs and contributes to local economies near the resources. For every two megawatts of geothermal development, there are five quality jobs created, and highest for any renewable energy. Operators pay local taxes and pay royalties for state and federal lands. Geothermal energy always also helps to fight climate change by helping with electrification and decarbonizing our economy, and is a reliable source of energy that gives clean renewable power and heat that's always on. As a flexible base load, geothermal power will play a substantial ro role in maintaining a functioning electricity grid. It can provide the electricity grid with resiliency, reliability, and stability as we transition to renewable fuels. It's a stable 24-7 energy source with capacity factors greater than 70% in practice, higher than any other power resource except nuclear. It can be ramped up and down, so it's flexible to give power when it's needed, and can help balance the grid when intermittent renewables come on or off. Mitigating the so-called duck curve, where large demand ramps are needed due to evening consumption combined with solar generation coming offline as the sun sets. Geothermal power also provides ancillary services that are so important to maintaining a resilient and stable power grid with black start capabilities, spinning and non-spinning reserves, and frequency regulation. I like to think of geothermal as a facilitator of renewables that allow us to transition to more solar and wind, meaning that the renewable power industry has a win-win opportunity to collaborate for the benefit of everybody. In the US, current power production is focused on the western states where the most accessible resources are found. California is the largest producer and has the largest geothermal field in the world. However, the earth is hot everywhere. It's just how deep we want to drill and the economics of recovery. This map indicates the temperature of the subsurface and access to hot rock. The benefit of EGS that I mentioned earlier is that we can tap into that resource almost anywhere. Resource projects in, research projects in EGS are being performed all over the world. In USA, there are two large projects funded by the DOE's uh, GTO and by Bill Gates' Breakthrough Energy Ventures. So in the USA, we have 3.6 gigawatts of installed geothermal power capacity. We have about 1.2 gigawatts being developed. A recent study by the Department of Energy called Geovision shows there can be over 60 gigawatts of capacity by 2050 if we enable cost-competitive geothermal expansion. Total accessible res resources from EGS can provide much more than 100 gigawatts of power according to other government studies. The DOE's Geovision study is pivotal and far-reaching. It highlights the importance of geothermal in the energy mix, not just in electricity generation, but also in direct use of heat for domestic and commercial applications and geothermal heat pumps in buildings. The report shows that if we can bring down regulatory time frames and well costs and enable geothermal anywhere, then we can see amazing market growth through 2050. 
We can, we can scale up existing geothermal heat pump technologies in residential and commercial buildings. We can include heat pumps in new builds and retrofit existing buildings to reach 28 million installations. We can develop district heating systems that supply heat directly to communities and industries, leading to an estimated 17,500 installed systems. And the 60 gigawatts of estimated power capacity means geothermal will provide 10% of total US electricity demand. This is a vast potential for economic expansion. On the Hill, 2019 has been a very busy year. We've had three congressional hearings, one in June with the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, one in September with the House Committee on Natural Resources, Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources, and one yesterday with the, the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology, Subcommittee on Energy. The previous year we had a congressional hearing was in 2007. It has also been a busy year for draft legislation that includes geothermal energy. And I've given some of those um, uh, draft legislation there. The GRC's policy committee has followed this activity with great interest and supports all the draft legislation. The PC is an independently funded group of interested organizations advocating on behalf of the geothermal community. The chairman of the committee, Paul Thompson with Ormac Technologies Inc, testified at two of the hearings this year. Our past president, Maria Richards, from Southern Methodist University testified at the hearing yesterday. We look forward to seeing the next steps on these bills and are excited about the possible outcomes. Lastly, I want to switch gears a bit and talk about lithium. Geothermal developers are looking at ways of increasing the value of geothermal plants where possible so as to make power production even more competitive. One way to achieve this is through co-production of minerals with the power. In an area like the Imperial Valley in Southern California, the minerals are transported in the geothermal brine that is extracted from the hot rocks at depth and currently pumped back into the reservoir. The demand for lithium will increase substantially over the next 10 years as society transitions to using more battery, and store, battery storage and transportation turns to electric vehicles. The supply of lithium is becoming a national importance as battery markets and technologies develop. Mineral security becomes critical as the US currently produces hardly any lithium. Now it so happens that in Imperial Valley, there's a huge resource of lithium in the geothermal brines. Companies like Berkshire Hathaway Energy have been investigating how to recover that lithium and estimate that the region could produce over two-thirds of the world's demand in 2025 and at very competitive costs elsewhere. This symbiosis of geothermal power and mineral recovery is an amazing opportunity as the mineral extraction techniques will need to power, the power uh, will need power that can be obtained from the same renewable and clean energy source. It also has many opportunities for expanding local economies as battery and vehicle manufacturers potentially move into the same area as lithium production. So to conclude, the geothermal industry is helping build a future where geothermal power and heat can be rolled out across the nation as a critical source of renewable energy for US households and businesses as we transition to a clean energy future. It's clear that society needs geothermal now, so we'd better get to it. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, well, one of your slides mentioned district heating systems, and I'm glad that you went into the battery issue a little bit, but when I think of district heating systems, I think of things that are you know, sort of sit underneath or sit alongside major cities, but you said there's 17,500 district heating systems. Can you just describe a little bit about what that is and, and where those are located? Um, so there aren't 17,500 now, but the okay. geovision study... That's the geovision study. Yeah, the geovision study from DOE um, estimates that 17,500 could be installed across the nation by 2050. Um, but you're correct. The, the community heating systems effectively extract hot water from underground and then pump that through um, buildings um, can be downtown, residential buildings, commercial buildings, and so forth. Um, the one uh, great example that we have is Boise in Idaho. Oh. 
Um, they have a district heating system that supplies the whole downtown area. Um, so it would be a great opportunity for the future. And commercial buildings and others, they buy that just like they would buy power from the utility company. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Our next uh, panelist is Peter Thompson. Peter is the project coordinator at the Biomass Thermal Energy Council, or BTEC. He works with BTEC's government affairs rep to mobilize membership to advance the policy goals of the biomass heating industry at the federal level. And those policy goals include the sustainable use of wood and agriculture biomass, or agricultural biomass, for clean and efficient heat and combined heat and power to help us meet our energy needs while strengthening communities and local economies. Peter, welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. I want to thank EESI and uh, CET, CETSA for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak to everyone. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, I just mentioned BTEC's mission. Uh, we advance the sustainable use of biomass. Our membership spans uh, the entire industry. We're fuel producers, equipment manufacturers, uh, engineers, installers, uh, government agencies, and uh, other nonprofits, academia. Um, and we have three main focus areas, policy and government affairs, technical and regulatory affairs, um, and then education and outreach. Um, so I just want to start with uh, U.S. energy consumption. In 2017, 11% of that was comprised of renewable energy, 44% of which uh, came from biomass feedstocks. That is what I'm here to talk about today. Um, so these are the sectors uh, that utilize woody biomass for energy, uh, residential, commercial, institutional, uh, and industrial, biomass power plants, um, export products, and emerging technologies. Uh, there's a few applications listed next to those. Um, and then I just want to get into, um, is this su sustainable? So uh, this data is from the U.S. Forest Service. So forest area uh, and population growth are, um, since the 1850s, uh, forest area you can see at the, towards the end of that um, century were declining pretty steadily. Uh, then the U.S. Forest Service was established to manage the nation's forest lands, and that uh, ended, the decline of forest area ended at that point, and we experienced a tripling of the population since then. So our forest lands are stable at this time. Um, and then uh, since mid-last century, uh, our growth rate, uh, and compared to our removals from those forests, uh, the growth rate exceeds uh, removals. So uh, we're not uh, removing more carbon than we're growing, which is uh, both very encouraging, but there are a variety of issues facing the forest uh, today and I'm here to talk about those as well. Uh, so the first one would be development pressures and land uses. Uh, forests need markets to remain forests. If you don't have a value for those resources, people will just convert that land to another use, whether it be agricultural land, uh, buildings, something else. So if you want to keep a forest, you have to make sure that that, va that resource is valued in some way for the benefits it's providing our society. Um, the next one is forest management. Uh, on the, so you, uh, on the previous slide, I showed that. That was private and public lands. Uh, so we're having uh, problems in the western half of the United States where uh, most of the public land or public forests are owned by the government. Uh, so there's a lack of funding for forest management. Uh, what we're experiencing there is a buildup of uh, dead standing trees. And um, just for example, in Colorado, one in 14 trees is uh, a dead standing tree. So it's not absorbing any more carbon. It's just sitting there waiting to uh, either spark or just continue to sit there. So it's not sequestering any more carbon. Uh, that accounts for 834 million trees in Colorado alone, dead standing. Um, so we, we argue that we need to remove those to mitigate the risk of wildfire uh, and uh, prevent the spread of these diseases like these uh, infestations, uh, southern pine beetle in uh, Georgia, um, mountain pine beetle in South Dakota, and bark beetles in Colorado and California. Uh, they're destroying our forests, so uh, we got to remove those. Um, and if you add those all, well, sorry, and then rapidly shifting energy markets. So if you have cheap fossil fuels available, um, our, our fuels, wood fuels, are uh, not competitive. They just can't, they can't compete. Um, and then also climate change exacerbates uh, many of these issues. Um, so then you see uh, issues like in California last year, the 2018 campfire was the deadliest fire in California's history, killing 85 people. Um, I have some other figures here. Uh, it, uh, caused $16.5 billion of damage, and it destroyed 130, 150,000 acres of uh, forest land and the town of Paradise, California. So uh, the stakes are pretty high, I would uh, put to you, um, to make sure that we have healthy forests. Um, so what, how do we do that? Uh, well, we manage our forests. We make sure that we're going in there 
making sure that we're removing diseased or infested trees so that those uh, diseases and infestations don't uh, spread. Uh, you could uh, compare it to an epidemic of some sort with uh, like a human disease. You want to contain it. You got to contain the disease before it spreads and uh, causes more harm and uh, puts the healthy uh, areas at risk. So uh, this picture here, uh, this is after a wildfire fire direction going down the hill. Uh, before that fire hit, they thinned out the forest uh, before the homes, and the homes uh, were saved because they thinned out and the fire was stopped in its tracks, essentially at the, towards the bottom of the crest of that, uh, that hill. Um, so uh, we argue once you remove those uh, trees, from those resources from uh, the forests, what are you going to do with them? Uh, right now, the U.S. Forest Service practice is to just pile them up, let them sit, and in some cases, they actually just burn them openly in these, what you would call uh, an open burner. It's just emitting, I mean, either way, it's emitting uh, the, the emissions into the air um, directly from the wildfire or the, the open burning just to get rid of the resource. So uh, we argue that the benefits of wood energy will uh, help reestablish uh, markets for low-value wood uh, for the private sector, um, and then also in the public sector, uh, much, much of the budget is being spent on wildfire uh, suppression. We need to shift that and put more resources into wildfire prevention and uh, forest health. Um, so we can also increase uh, rural economic development, job creation, uh, and we provide energy savings um, in recent winters in the Northeast where our technology has high penetration. Um, it, there was a scene of 50% uh, cost savings compared to heating oil. Uh, when shortages came at the end of a very cold winter uh, a year and a half ago. So um, key barriers for deployment for us, um, there, there are three that I'm going to address here. Uh, the first one is the high capital cost at low volume of production for biomass heating systems. Um, that's similar to all other renewables at low scale of production. You're not going to see uh, the scale up, the benefits of scaling up production and cost savings. So there has to be some sort of mechanism that helps people deploy these systems and ramp up production so that we can see that cost savings compared to the already high volume production of uh, fossil fuel heating systems. Um, the next one is uh, the low value wood requires markets uh, to be economically viable. So in recent years, um, especially in the Northeast, because of the cheap fossil fuels, we're seeing closures of pellet mills. And also, there's a decline in the um, pulp and paper. Those, those are the two main feedstocks for these uh, low-value wood resources. Um, they typically go there and are made for something made into other products, whether it be pellets or paper. So um, we we just <laughs> we need to um, make sure that those markets are available so that we can um, uh, continue to manage our forests properly. Otherwise, they'll, like I said earlier, be converted for another use. Um, and then also the last one, uh, and this goes across all energy sectors, we need to have a comprehensive uh, carbon intensity accounting and pricing for all the energy options. And until we do that, uh, renewables, all renewables, I think, uh, will remain a secondary role compared to fossil fuels. So we need to address that. Okay, uh, so I wouldn't be here if I didn't have some homework for everybody. Um, so we have two pieces of pending legislation. Uh, the big one, the reason why BTEC was founded, was the Biomass Thermal Utilization Act, or HR 1479 S628. Uh, so this is an investment tax credit for those biomass heating systems of 30% if they reach an efficiency of 80% or higher. So uh, we are deploying highly efficient, low emitting uh, systems across the country that provide energy resilience to communities, and uh, you're helping people save money there. Um, the next one addresses the residential side, uh, the Wood Heaters Emissions Reduction Act. Uh, that's a grant program, $75 million a year, that was introduced in the Senate uh, this past um, winter. It's just, I mean, this past summer, excuse me, for a winter fuel. Um, so that was introduced. Uh, it's estimated there's 6 million uh, residential wood heaters across the country that don't even meet 1988 EPA new source performance standards. Uh, the EPA enacted new ones in 2015, and there's going to be new ones again in 2020, uh, step two compliance of uh, NSPS. So uh, we need to help people uh, have the resources available so that we can deploy those more expensive, newer, lower emitting systems and uh, improve air quality and uh, health impacts. Um, so, uh, and then there's existing programs, but we can also improve those. Uh, the renewable fuel standards have been very successful in mixing in renewable fuels for transportation. Um, there's a group, uh, the Biomass Power Association and American Biogas Council, that are pushing for electric pathways to be opened up in the EPRFS currently. 
Um, and then we would also argue because uh, thermal energy accounts for 33% of the total U.S. energy demand, uh, we would uh, like to see thermal applications uh, qualify for the EPA RFS. Um, the next, one, next two are actually from the Farm Bill last year. Uh, thanks for including those. Um, so there's the Community Wood Energy and Wood Innovations Program uh, that has authorized funding currently. The Senate has uh, provided a partial $5 million appropriation. So we would like to see that uh, move forward in any appropriation bill uh, that goes forward. And then the Bioenergy Program for Advanced Biofuels, uh, immensely successful program for fuel producers to expand their production to uh, bring more uh, fuels to market. Um, uh, traditionally, it was uh, dominated by uh, the biodiesel sector, but in the latest farm bill, they uh, limited the amount of uh, uh, payments that can go to a specific fuel type at 35%. So that should increase the participation from other industries like uh, the pellet producing industry. So uh, we're very happy about that, and we look forward to seeing that implemented. Um, and then actions to take, uh, co-sponsor the BTU Act, H.R. 1479 S. 628, um, and the Wood Heaters Emission Reduction Act, if you're in the House and you have the capability, uh, maybe introduce a version of it there, <laughs> and we can get that moving forward. Um, and then work with us to direct EPA to expand the renewable fuel standard uh, to include uh, wood pellets and chips as qualifying fuels for thermal pathways, but as well um, as ele for electric pathways that are coming. Um, and then again, thank you for uh, your work on the Farm Bill last year. There's a lot of uh, good stuff in there that's going to help our industry uh, continue to be viable and uh, provide energy solutions for people. So that's the woody biomass side of things. Uh, <laughs> I'm also going to talk about uh, biogas. Uh, we have friends at the American Biogas Council, so uh, I wanted to also highlight that because it's very important to sustain sustainable biomass. So um, in the United States, uh, every year, 66 and a half million tons of food waste are produced every year. Uh, 31 billion gallons of wastewater every single day. And uh, there are manure and nutrients from 8 billion cows, chickens, turkeys, and pigs across the country. So what, how are we going to deal with all that waste? It has to be managed somehow. It can't, if we just let it sit there, it's going to emit uh, uh, methane into the air and just decompose uh, what you're seeing in a lot of landfills um, and on uh, factory farms. So that needs to be addressed. Um, the U.S. biogas market, uh, currently there's 2,200 uh, biogas systems in the, in the country, but there's a potential for four, over 14,000. So uh, we need to unleash that potential um, and uh, yeah, just help uh, realize it, use that uh, resource. So what, what does that mean in practical terms? Uh, that would require $40 billion in uh, capital deployment for 13,500 uh, U.S. biogas systems. Uh, provides 335,000 short-term construction jobs, 23,000 permanent jobs, and uh, the 23,000 permanent jobs are well-paying uh, between 50K and 100K people in rural communities and their non-college jobs. So uh, that's a Good thing. And then uh, just, uh, just a comparison to the, the big, the big uh, technologies on the block, solar and wind. Um, this is a baseload technology. This, this, uh, this fuel that it, uh, a biogas system produces is uh, available 24-7. Uh, it's always there. Uh, it's a ba it provides baseload energy for uh, people in these communities. So, um, sorry. So to receive the same capacity from solar and wind, you would have to deploy five times the amount of uh, systems compared to one biogas system, um, than what we're currently seeing. Um, and then there's also, for both of the, the options, woody biomass and non-forest uh, biomass, uh, uh, there's also non-energy benefits. So this, um, uh, there's uh, waste management, nutrient recycling. Um, I can speak to the, the, I can speak to those uh, a little bit better. Um, if I had more time, but um, anyways, policy solutions. So if you are um, involved in any of these issues, uh, the RFS, infrastructure, climate, watership protection, um, these, are the, these are the issues that biogas should be part of the conversation. Um, there's a variety of um, uh, programs that are, we're engaging with. Uh, the RFS, uh, right now the uh, waiver and uh, small refinery exemptions are being abused by the uh, current administration uh, being given out uh, in the wrong ways. Uh, that needs to end, and uh, I'm almost done, I promise. And then uh, the Farm Bill had a lot of helpful programs uh, in it. 
So uh, we would uh, argue that they, they need to be appropriated. They didn't get the same mandatory funding in the previous farm bill, so we'd like to see those appropriations see, uh, enacted. Um, and then finally, tax extenders. If you're going to extend uh, tax incentives to some renewable technologies but others, that just hurts uh, the deployment of all the portfolio of solutions that we need to address these issues. So um, I would argue just uh, take a holistic view of all these technologies that have benefits for our society beyond just the uh, zero carbon. Um, and I'll just close by saying that all of these technologies are readily available, at least one of them. Uh, the feedstocks are readily available in every community across the country. They provide uh, economic opportunities. Uh, they provide uh, energy resilience, security, and independence, and they help maintain our environment. And uh, with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'm glad you made that last point because I was going to ask you about a lot of these facilities are pretty close to where the feedstocks come from, right? Like you can be pretty close to, you know, where you get your sludge or where you have your manure and, you know, within a couple yards maybe even or a couple hundred yards you might have the digesters and some of these other technologies. That's true. And uh, in, in the case of woody biomass, uh, the resource that's extracted from the forest, it's used within 50 to 75 miles of where it's extracted, so it doesn't travel very far. It's a very circular local economy, and that's very encouraging. Okay. Thanks. Uh, our final panelist, but certainly not the least panelist, uh, is Jason Berwin. He is the Vice President of Policy at the Energy Storage Association. Before joining ESA, Jason was uh, the Associate Director for Energy Innovation at the Bipartisan Policy Center, another good friend of EESI's where he directed research and advocacy on U.S. energy research and development and tax policy. He also served as staff director of the American Energy Innovation Council, a group of CEOs led by Bill Gates to adv advocate for greater U.S. federal investments in clean energy technology development. Jason's earned degrees from the University of California, Berkeley, and Columbia University. And uh, look, really looking forward to what you have to say, Jason. Come on up. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I am a person. I am standing before you. I know you've been listening to a lot of talking. I will try to make this a little more energetic so that we can slide into a Q&A perhaps a little faster uh, and not keep you all listening to the sound of my voice. Um, I am the Vice President of Policy for the U.S. Energy Storage Association. We are the National Trade Association here in the United States representing all parts of the value chain of energy storage. So that's not just manufacturers and component suppliers. Those are the people who are putting together these facilities, developing them, putting them on the grid, and then operating them. Utilities, independent power producers, large end users. Uh, we're also a multi-technology organization. When you think of energy storage, what comes to mind? Anyone? Anyone? No fourth wall. What? Solar. Lithium ion batteries. Hydro, like pumped hydropower. Hydrogen. Rubber bands. If you did them large enough and taut enough and could, yeah, you know, like kinetic energy. Um, storage is many technologies, and we represent a large set of technologies. The preponderance of our members are focused on battery storage because that is the fastest growing segment of the industry. But we have folks doing a variety of battery chemistries, as well as thermal storage, mechanical storage, and chemical storage in the form of things like hydrogen. Um, storage is important because what you have in the power sector is a system that is designed around a single constraint. Supply and demand have to match every moment, every hour, every day, every season, every year in order to avoid disruption and blackouts on the system. That kind of a system has to run under very constrained operational choices in order to make that happen. When you introduce storage, you relax that constraint and, in fact, enable a variety and larger range of operational possibilities. That flexibility is fundamentally what storage is providing to the power system and why it's so incredibly critical, particularly when we're having a conversation about renewable energy on the power grid. Because, as I think everyone has noted, renewable energy is based on, in the case of wind and solar, upon when you are in fact having that access to the sun or to the wind. Obviously there are other resources that do not depend on weather as much, but suffice it to say that given the amount of 
development we've seen in the wind and solar sector, storage has become an extraordinarily critical part of this conversation if we are to move to higher and higher deployments of wind and solar. Um, just for a little bit of a market snapshot, um, the, uh, the, the, we, have about, we have just over one gigawatt of batteries now connected to the electric grid. I did not create any slides for you, so you have to look at my face, but you know what they look like? You know what they're made of? What's in here and, and what's in your laptops? That's the same core technology as these lithium ion battery cells just scaled to a much larger array. They look like shipping containers by and large. They're not that sexy, but somehow Elon Musk has made them extremely sexy, so I'll take it. Um, and so we have one gigawatts, just over one gigawatt of batteries on the grid. We have 22 gigawatts of pumped hydro storage on the electricity grid. Um, harder to get uh, sort of a measure of thermal storage. I've heard around three gigawatts of thermal storage capability on the electric system and plenty more to come. Um, the reason why, does anyone know why well, the reason why we're focused a lot these days on batteries, and particularly lithium-ion batteries, is because the costs of lithium-ion batteries are dropping extremely quickly. You saw Bill's charts of solar and wind declines. Storage is falling even faster than that. Uh, this, it historically has been about cut in half on installed costs every three to four years, which is dramatic. Does anyone know what's driving those cost declines? Anyone, anyone, anyone? What? Tech innovation. Sort of, but not exactly. Anyone else guess? Electric vehicles. The global build out of electric vehicles, which I think uh, was, uh, Will showed the demand for lithium ion was going to be driven globally by electric vehicles, is ultimately what's driving the cost of grid battery storage down. So we're really riding that kind of dramatic expansion and scale of manufacturing globally. And that's what's really making this turn very quickly from something that people talked about as theoretically possible to now being installed at the hundreds of megawatts per year on the US electric system. The reason why storage is also something that I think excites a lot of folks in the utility sector, independent power producers, large end users, is because it provides really three core values. The first is that you are able to save money when you don't have to build as much spare capacity on your power system in the form of excess power plants or excess wires. Because supply and demand have to match in the power system moment to moment, if we have one day a year where the power demand is up here and the rest of the year it's a lot lower, well, we still have to build all the power plants and all the wires to serve that one day of highest peak demand. And so, in fact, we have an enormous amount of underutilized capital assets in our power system. When you have storage, you have the ability to store and meet those kinds of peak demands on the system without having something that necessarily idles the rest of the year because the storage can be used continuously for a variety of purposes. So you're able to actually save folks an enormous amount of money through that process. The second key value here is reliability and resilience. Anyone who's in California right now will tell you that they are thinking about what a battery might mean for their ability to get through an outage being imposed because of wildfire shutoff safety risks. Um, additionally, as you go to higher and higher levels of things like renewables on the electric system, the oscillating change in supply and demand over time requires an extraordinarily fast, flexible response on the electric grid to remain stable. Storage has been providing this at increasing scale. Started, in fact, here in the Mid-Atlantic region. The first market globally was here in the PJM Mid-Atlantic regional grid, which brought on nearly 300 megawatts of batteries to stabilize the grid. Uh, more effectively than gas-fired or other uh, power plant technologies. And then the final and key value, I think, for a lot of folks in this discussion is integrating a diverse range of resources uh, that's more renewables, making non-dispatchable renewables controllable, but also, for that matter, taking inflexible resources like nuclear and allowing them to be effectively accommodated and have the flexibility to be able to allow them to play well with the rest of the grid. 
for that matter, distributed resources. As we see more build out of things like rooftop solar, electric vehicles, things that are at the edge of the grid, storage is helping to make sure those get integrated without disrupting the grid locally and putting more stresses on that would otherwise make those in a, uh, too expensive to host. So when you bring storage into your system, you're getting all of these benefits. An example that I think, you know, I just read literally before coming here, what kind of things we're seeing now, uh, Salt River Project, so this is a, uh, a electric cooperative in Arizona, just announced they are now going to build a 250 megawatt solar facility paired with a 1,000 megawatt hour battery. So that's a battery that's 250 megawatts, the same size as a solar plant, and can store four hours of that rated capacity from the solar. So the sun shines throughout the day. As it starts going down in the evening, the battery is going to kick in and keep all through the evening peak the same amount of generation being supplied to Arizona residents all from the sun. So that's really the incredible power when you're able to put this kind of resource on the system and what's driving, again, a lot of the interest we're seeing in places such as Bill had mentioned that are now saying, well, if we're going to go to 100% clean or 100% renewable or what have you, storage has to be a part of that solution. States are a lot of times driving this conversation. So we've been seeing things like deployment targets, places like New York, California, Massachusetts. Um, I think there's a discussion right now in Nevada to establish one. Uh, there are obviously other state policies driving this, but from the federal level, we're also seeing enormous bicameral and bipartisan interest. Uh, I think that many folks might have seen in September, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee uh, approved and amended, uh, amended and approved the Better Energy Storage Technology Act, Senate File 1603, which would provide a $1.4 billion authorization of a massively multi-technology, multi-application energy storage research development and demonstration program, effectively elevating storage to one of the top priorities of the Department of Energy's applied R&D objectives, something that we strongly support and, again, has bipartisan support. Um, the other, I think, most exciting thing moving forward right now is investment tax credit eligibility for energy storage. Uh, Senate Bill 1142, uh, House File 2096, again, bipartisan in both chambers. And what this bill does is basically take a quirk of administrative guidance from the IRS. Right now, you can count storage as eligible for the ITC when it is paired with an ITC-eligible generating resource, so like a solar plant, for example. So that is why, in part, you see, when you hear about storage these days, a lot of it is storage plus solar, because when you integrate it with the solar, you get the 30% investment tax credit. There is no reason, though, why that benefit cannot be shared widely by wind power, by hydro, by geothermal, by, in fact, any number of other resources on the electric system. So we think that it's important that storage be untied from just being paired with only solar, for that matter, folks in the solar industry are excited to see storage have its own standalone eligibility for the investment tax credit because we have thousands of solar projects that have been deployed, but it, you can't add the battery now and get that tax credit, whereas new builds can. So it's all going into new build. We have an enormous opportunity right now to create a wave of new jobs and economic development just by retrofitting all of the already existing solar with batteries and other storage technologies. Uh, and then ultimately it's about leveling the playing field. Storage is one source of flexibility that we have in the electric system. There are other sources as well. Some of those, like fuel cells, for example, or micro turbines, have access to the investment tax credit. So we want to see just making sure that we're not distorting the investment signals across the grid for the best op uh, uh, solutions for grid flexibility. And I might add, this is all storage technologies. Back to what we started with, that doesn't just mean lithium-ion batteries. It means hydrogen. It means pumped hydro. It means molten salt thermal storage. It means underground uh, pumped hydro or geomechanical uh, pumped hydro storage. It means all of these new innovative technologies that the investment community is focused on because we all see how important this technology is to going to higher and higher shares 
of clean and renewable energy in our grid. So uh, if you have any questions, of course, please feel free to contact me afterwards. The Energy Storage Association's website is energystorage.org. And look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That was great. And I'm, I'm, I, this, I'm glad we're talking about the EV issue because Edison Electric Institute, which is the utility trade group, they say that there's going to be like 7.5 million EVs on the road by about 2025. There's about 1 million right now. But that number will almost quadruple by 2030. And each one of those is basically just a four-wheeled battery. And we have to park them somewhere. We have to park them in our homes. Uh, and I have a feeling that something you're tracking very closely. Um, but it's going to really change the way we use energy in our homes um, and how we think about sort of reliability and resilience. Um, I'm not going to ask you a specific follow-up because I'm going to give you the first crack at our first question because you came up with it. Um, and uh, I will, we have a roving microphone that will soon be dispatched because we're, Melody will have it, uh, because we're going to be, um, because we're recorded, it's important that we ask our questions into a microphone so that everybody can hear. So when we get to the audience questions, please just wait for the mic. But I'm going to start, and Jason, I'm going to start with you. Magic wand time. Uh, what could Congress do before the end of the year to make life better for the Energy Storage Association? Um, for the energy storage industry, I think the most important thing, of course, would be, in fact, enacting uh, investment tax credit eligibility for energy storage technologies. It's, you know, right now, uh, the House, uh, I think it was the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition, 166 House members signed a letter to leadership just a couple of weeks ago stating a number of priorities at the top of that list, energy storage ITC eligibility. Uh, I think a lot of us are looking forward to what the House Ways and Means Committee is going to include the next week. And we understand that in the Senate right now as well, there's obviously an ongoing discussion about what can be included in an end-of-year package. I don't think there's a single more impactful, feasible thing that can get done this year for renewable energy than ITC eligibility for storage. Maybe for the industry, but it will make ESA's life a lot easier too, my guess is. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I personally would enjoy being able to take a like very easy 2020 yes um we're going to come all the way down the line uh peter you're next uh same question to you but for your industry uh i already said it but uh pass the btu act hr 1479 s 628 and then on the biogas side of things uh, that would be tax credits for hr 4186 and hr 3744 so tax credits are huge for renewable energy industries thanks uh will yeah, I'm, I agree with Jason. Actually, the um, the, the tax legislation is obviously a, is, a, is obviously a key part to it. Um, the, ta the tax extenders acts that uh, that are out there, um, but then also we in the geothermal world, and I, I included it on that slide um, that's in your pack. Um, we have three draft uh, bills that were were put together and published this year, and. And also something that Jason mentioned is, is how bipartisan um, some of this is. Um, and, and I just wanted to, 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 to just go through those three bills very quickly, if I can, um, to highlight that. The, the first one is um, uh, Senators Cortez, Masto, and, and Wyden, uh, who published the Geothermal Energy Opportunities Act. And then um, Senators uh, Lisa Murkowski and Joe Manchin, um, published the Advanced Geothermal Innovation uh, Leadership Act. Um, and then um, Senator Jim Reich and Congressman Russ Falker published the Enhanced uh, Geothermal Production on, on Federal Lands Act. Um, so, and there's a real mixture of, as I say, bipartisan appeal in, in, in those uh, draft acts. So um, I think we have a really good chance of bringing those together and, and getting, um, getting those uh, past. So. Thanks. And Bill, you have a broader perspective um, on the industry. What, what do you think? Uh, uh, happily, I'm going to agree with all of my colleagues here. I'm going to start, the, the first thing I'm going to say is um, the tax extenders uh, is, is important this year. You have uh, uh, some of these technologies, their incentives expired at the end of 2017. So, so they need to be uh, renewed for sure. Um, and, and can all be part of the mix if we have smart policy. Here's, I, I do want to pull back the lens, though, and I, I'm, I'm particularly keen on, on, on Jason's idea uh, on, the, on the energy storage, the freestanding energy storage ITC. I want to call attention 
to uh, um, because this is my shorthand for folks who want to walk away with this there's a pile of these letters um, uh, out on the table it's a multi-sector uh, letter from the entire renewable sector um, uh, the climate community all the national environmental organizations you know from national wildlife uh, uh, federation to um, to the sunrise movement uh, are, are signatories uh, to this letter. I encourage people, it's sort of a cheat sheet for um, what's going to be at play at this year-end tax extenders uh, legislation, which is going to get combined with it, with what, can, what progress can we make on, on clean energy and climate um, this year. The, the, the broader view that I want to share is I remember at the beginning of the year we were thinking about this and when we were talking with the, the national environmental community and um, uh, you know, storage, this, this legislative ITC has been kicking around for a while, and then people will recall it sort of maybe faded for some a little bit, but in the beginning of the year, there's a lot of talk about the Green New Deal, right? That was a an, big national goal and the urgency and so forth, which is um, certainly something um, that ACOR um, uh, endorses as, as an aspiration. Um, we think about it, the typical thing as a congressional staffers will also think about the legacy credits about the PTC and the ITC and that's sort of the known quantity and so forth. On a go-forward basis, I just want to pick up and amplify something Jason said. When you get to penetrations 50, 60, 70, 80 percent or higher, uh, approach sort of Green New Deal aspiration, it, you simply have to have massively expanded deployment of storage to make that work. You, you, you just do. And so what I, what I say to my sort of, you know, friends and congressional staffers here, there may be a, an opportunity in the not so um, distant future to have a separate discussion about larger climate policy. But in today's environment where agreement is going to have to be secured from the House and the Senate and on a bipartisan basis, uh, if you think of a de the three legs of a decarbonized stool, and we'll forgive my, my, my friends here, but because I'm for the extenders and, and for maximizing deployment of all these technologies, but Given current trends, you know, utility scale, solar, wind, and storage really is the third um, uh, uh, leg of that stool. It happens to be the one politically that's making itself available to us this year. And we would be fools not, not to take it. So to the degree your bosses, my guess is seven out of 10 of you of statistics don't lie, probably did sign the seek letter that Jason referenced. That's really important. Um, please have your bosses weigh in in support of including things like an energy storage uh, tax credit. I would throw, throw in EVs and offshore wind as, 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 as solid bicameral bipartisan candidates for enactment this year on the year-end spending bill as part of that tax extenders negotiation. It's kind of quaint. You're thinking about a year-end spending bill. I was thinking about like a December 20th punt to February or March. But. I think they're going to go to December 20th, right, folks? <laughs> Unless, unless the president uh, vetoes it. <laughs> Depends on how shiny the Christmas tree is. Yeah. Uh, questions from the audience? We have a roving mic right here in the back. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering what you feel the feasibility is if there is any of establishing a national RPS? Um, so I would say uh, this year and heading into the election year, uh, that's a low probability event. But I, let, me, let me address the merits uh, un underlying your question. We saw one of the slides that I you know, offered was um, there's, there's two things that I think recommend very st strong uh, and serious consideration of a national RPS. The first is the massive experience that we have at the, at the state level. This is, this is a known quantity. We know how this works. And uh, in fact, it does work. Um, and the second thing I, I, I think I would call out is um, and this is not, you know, we're actually, ACOR is about to release a climate policy options paper that, that compares RPS, CES, tech neutral tax credit, carbon pricing, and also grid modernization. But another distinct advantage, in addition to the experience of the states with, with RPSs, is it, it, it directly drives demand for renewable power by design. And when you have certainty around demand, you give investors certainty to invest. And if we need to scale up at, at a rate to meet Paris uh, 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 climate goals, uh, I think an RPS could be an incredibly, or CES, provided it's properly structured, could be an incredibly uh, helpful policy tool in any comprehensive climate plan. Other comments from the panel? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Bill. Um, and I think seeing the experience in, in California, um, the states are already doing it um, independently. So um, I think the, the federal government has to 
to come along at some point and, and join the club. Um, the other thing as well is, is obviously um, greenhouse gas emission targets. I think it, it goes hand in hand. So um, bringing in le legislation that really targets um, um, both uh, is, is really important. I would also agree, but uh, if you look at specific RPS or inconsistencies from state to state, uh, some states treat biomass uh, energy as a fossil fuel essentially because it emits carbon. Uh, that's carbon that's in the uh, already existing carbon in the atmosphere. It's not fossil carbon. Um, in states like the Northeast, they look very beneficial for biomass and they treat it uh, in the way that we see it, that it should be reflected. So uh, I think that a national RPS could be beneficial um, as long as we have comprehensive uh, carbon accounting for each of the technologies. Jason, do you have anything then? Okay. Well, so long as we're talking about three-legged stools, you know, we've talked about greenhouse gas reductions goals, we've talked about renewable portfolio standards, it's probably my job to also mention energy efficiency. Um, it's you know, another integrating set of technologies that make all of this easier to do. Um, other questions? Oh, we've got two. Well, I guess we have to ask Carol. Carol. And then we'll go right behind Carol. Uh, first of all, thank you all very, very much. And there, so you've laid out a whole series of policy measures as well as documentation for the enormous contributions that can be made across the whole family of renewable technologies. So. My question is, I am presuming that all of you are submitting all of these ideas for both near term and also sort of the visions and everything to the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, because it's critical that you all get this in so that there really is a full breadth of, you know, looking at the whole universe of what truly is possible. Uh Answer from ACOR is, uh, well, actually, you know, Jason, why don't you start down there since we. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, and I think one thing that, just to step back a second and explain what I think is sort of harder to get at the 10,000 foot view that I just gave you from the podium, but from 50,000 feet, or let's go to space, and I'll tell you why I think storage is going to be such a big part of what the select committee needs to focus on. There are only three things you do with energy. You convert it, right, from one form to another. And that's what we do with wind and solar and gas turbines and geothermal and, you know, combustion and biomass. All these things are just conversion technologies. We transport it. We move it around. That's oftentimes in wires or in pipes. Sometimes it's by rail car, other things. Or we store it. We have a place where that energy sits until we need it. And you can get all the carbon out of your generating as much as you want and get the costs of the lower cost stuff down. You can build as many wires as possible to get away, for example, from fuels that move through pipes but if you can't figure out how to store energy better than a hydrocarbon, we're going to be dependent on them for the rest of time. And that's what the challenge ultimately comes down to and why energy storage is such a transformative set of technologies. Because when we can store energy without creating more carbon emissions, that is fundamentally going to unlock these non-carbon generation sources and ability to transport it around. That is ultimately the challenge of the 21st century power system for decarbonization at its core and why I am so passionate about energy storage, certainly, but also why I think when we think about this in the context of climate and decarbonization, why so much attention needs to go into the storage question. Bill? Yeah, so to answer Carol, Carol's question directly, yes, uh, the, the, the submission deadline is next week. So we're, we've, we're polishing them up uh, as we speak. Also submitted to uh, Energy and Commerce on their uh, 100 by 50 goal. But I do, we sort of said, well, we touched on carbon pricing, which we did. I actually, this is a group I think this is an appropriate observation to make, and we're going to um, uh, speak more to this um, dynamic in our climate policy options paper. I remember when I was a congressional staffer, my basic shorthand for carbon pricing was, you know, make dirty more expensive, get more clean, right? And unleash market forces and internalize the externality of carbon pollution, and, and that'll, you know, that's what we need to do. 
Um, it's, it's a true statement as far as it goes, but I do want to, since you are the kind of staff who will come to an event like this, I do want to call out that um, not all carbon pricing regimes are created equal. And when, it, when Congress gets around to addressing, if it chooses to, to pick up carbon pricing, it needs to be purpose built for the goal in mind. And here's what I mean by that. For example, in today's context, if the, if the goal of implementing carbon pricing is to accelerate deployment of renewable technologies as part of a plan to meet mid-century climate goals, say. Seems like it's a likely motivation. You need to take care not to design, to design a carbon price whose initial level and rate of uh, annual increase has the primary effect of incentivizing near-term fuel switching from coal to natural gas. If you do that, and it's very possible to design a system that will do this, you will see helpful reductions in the near term because natural gas is about half as emitting as coal. However, you will also have incentivized an entirely new generation of natural gas infrastructure whose useful life will far exceed the point after which their emissions become not helpful to achieving climate goals. So this is exactly the kind of audience I want to start socializing that kind of nuance and sophistication um, because of carbon pricing, it, there's a decent chance this could be coming. We need to be smart about it. Uh, thanks. Will, uh, Peter, do you have any other any comments and response? Are you writing RFI responses? I hope. I just um, I agree with Bill in answer to your question. We, we should definitely be getting um, comments in front of the, the select committee on, on climate crisis. Um, and you know, I think, I think going back to my opening statement in, in the presentation, uh, we need an all of the above type approach um, with clean energy. And, and yes, storage um, will play a huge role. Um, but the challenge with storage is that you, you have to get the energy into it faster than you take it out over the long term. So you need to produce that energy in the first place. Um, how many of us have, have, um, have got mobile phones that are continuously on the, on the low end of the, of the power scale? So we do need um, that energy generation to be there at all times to get that energy into the system. Um, but then also I, don't, I think what we have to also do is not focus completely on electricity. Um, this decarbonization of, that, that we're going to go through needs to be, as I say, an all, all of the above type approach where we also look at energy efficiency, as you mentioned. Um, the, the, greatest, the greatest thing for, for people to do in terms of, um, in terms of, en in terms of reducing their, uh, their bills in their houses, for instance, and decarbonizing their houses is, first of all, to make their houses more energy efficient. So we're going to need to be doing energy efficiency across the, the whole of, the, um, of our society. Um, and also, part of that is heat management, as I mentioned. Um, if we can get more effective heat management into our, into our homes and our buildings and our businesses, then we can do a lot more to, to, um, to bring down that need for the power in the first place and, and help decarbonize um, the whole of, of, of society. So. Yeah, I also agree with Bill, and uh, yes, it is necessary for biomass to provide comments on the proceeding, so we will be doing that. <laughs> well, I certainly know we're providing comments because poor Anna and Amber have been, and Ellen have been drafting them furiously for the last couple of weeks, so hopefully it's something everybody likes. Uh, we have time for at least one more question, and I promised that you would get to go next, so you get your next question. Hi, um, this question is probably very specifically for Mr. Parsons. Um, in your slides, you showed a spike in consumer demand in 2018, and I was wondering if that's also explained by R or if that's explained by something else. Um, great, qu thank you for the question. Um, no, so I, that, uh, so I'm, I'm guessing right now, but it's an educated guess. Um, 2018 would have been a bit, would, would be a bit of a lag for ARA funding to be showing up in a year-over-year -year bump 
in, in, in 2018. Um, what I would, my, the, the guess that I would offer is, is sort of the second thing that I think you mentioned, which is um, uh, that the economic recovery. Um, so, we're, so that um, you, you, you had that kind of uh, undergirding, supporting um, uh, demand, both on, on, on the on the C and I side, which is new. I mean, one thing I need to say: that it, it, one piece of that is the 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 C and I, the corporate, the new corporate demand, is not a cyclical thing that we've seen before. That's new. The idea these big companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon are coming out and saying, you know, really aggressive. We need 100 percent you know, uh, uh, carbon free by, uh, you know, a, a limited time period. That is a brand new driver and, it, you know, it was over, it was at eight and a half uh, uh, gigawatts uh, last year, which is massive. The, the increase in solar, I think, is, is, is a function of a, of a relatively healthy economy and also probably some people trying, a lot of times when credits expire, um, it, 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 it draws future uh, activity into the present in order to capture the value of the credit before the phase down. So that also could explain uh, part of that spike would be an educated guess. Uh, other questions? Oh, up here in the front. No, that was you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, quick question. Um, we talked a lot about um, decarbonizing the electricity grid. Um, we talk about energy generally. Um, the question is, what about renewable gas? as a way to decarbonize our energy sector. Background on this is um, we do have in the energy storage field an opportunity to use the gas grid, which is an asset that's stranded if we move away from natural gas altogether. Um, we can store renewable gas in there as an energy storage medium. Um, we can transition to use um, zero carbon fuels like hydrogen in the transportation sector for heavy duty, medium duty. Um, all of that can come from renewable gas, from excess renewable electricity generation, which we will have when we go to SB100 or like 100% renewable electricity. So where do you see the role of renewable gas in energy future of America? Thanks. So storage is storage. I mean, at the end of the day, the idea, I think DOE has this, um, moonshot goal, fuels from sunlight, they call it, right? Which is the idea that you might take basically the naturally occurring photonic energy that hits the earth every day uh, and be able to somehow take that, take carbon dioxide, and be able to create a synthetic fuel uh, without the actual sort of net addition of carbon to the atmosphere. This is very exciting stuff. I mean, to the extent that you can create something that is a net zero or potentially even reducing to the extent that you are able to uh, find ways, for example, to capture the emissions that do come off of the synthetically produced or for lack of a better word, renewable, that's really powerful. And I would say that the, in fact, the most important place to have that conversation is the industrial sector particularly, because as much as we talk about decarbonizing the energy system, decarbonizing industrial processes is like a 10 times harder process, and there's not really much of a way to replace the use of things like natural gas in industrial processes. So a clear-eyed view of dealing with climate challenges needs to take into account what we're going to do with that. So I think that particularly when you talk about the industrial sector, we have to be talking about all the options that are out there for decarbonization. Other comments? Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap there. Um, almost finished. This is my fourth briefing at ESI, and I've always managed to go a couple minutes over, but that's because we have such great panelists. So let's give everybody a final round of applause. Um, just a final reminder, uh, if you haven't already gotten into the habit of visiting eesi.org, please do. Um, and hopefully you'll use that opportunity to sign up for our new newsletter, Cl uh, Climate Change Solutions. It comes out every other Tuesday, and it's a great way to keep up with all of the goings-on at ESI. Next Friday, it might even be in this room. Uh, don't tell me, cut that. Um, next Friday, uh, we have a briefing on deep decarbonization, legal pathways to deep decarbonization. Uh, decarbonization. Hopefully you'll be able to join us for that. And I don't think it's been announced yet, but on December 4th, there's one on West Coast 
uh, coastal resilience. So that should be very interesting. We've done, we're going around the country bringing people in to talk about these resilience projects in their communities, and they've been fantastic. So thank you very much. Thanks to the ESI staff for pulling off a great briefing. Thanks again to our panelists, and I uh, hope everyone has a great weekend.